a quick story about me. I'm a long-term environmentalist, uh, but just over five years ago, our lives changed. Pat and I attended one of Al Gore's free three-day training programs called Climate Reality Project. And we came back as strong activists. We started pushing our local community to move toward clean energy. And now we still continue to attend town council meetings. We know all of our town elected and elected officials. We know all the managers of divisions in the town. We've talked to everybody. <clears throat> we've organized petitions. We've had signs, uh, petitions by 300 people. We've created rallies. We've held marches with our own megaphone. Uh, back on the shelf behind me, you'll see one. Um, <clears throat> so, but I'm gonna start sharing a screen right now. That's a little bit about me. And uh, this is a set of slides that hopefully now everybody can see. And for the life of me, I never have figured out how to know what I'm transmitting, but it should be one page, a full screen saying building electrification switch to a heat pump. Is that up on the screen? Okay. Thank you. I like the nodded yes, thank you. So we, Pat and I expanded to the cities around us. And then last year we expanded our activism to the state of New Jersey because, because of the much bigger greenhouse gas goals. And that's our focus is to remove and reduce greenhouse gases. And last year we organized a 50 by 30 team and successfully got Governor Murphy to sign an executive order declaring our first ever New Jersey goal of 50% total greenhouse gas reductions by 2030. And we're now using that goal. Uh, we probably weren't the only people, but we lay credit for it because a month later he did this. And so we're now using that 50 by 30 goal as a potent lever. Right now, 80% of New Jersey buildings are heated by frac gas. And all the New Jersey long-term plans call for elimination of frac, frac gas. Our goal is to move all residences and businesses to install highly efficient electrically powered heat pumps. But the heavyweight gas industry has frozen any positive movement. So <clears throat> my, my story now is focused on build, building electrification and about New Jersey's um, net zero goal. We lead a group of about 60 people. We call it the 50 by 30 building electrification team. Uh, we report to Sierra Club New Jersey chapter as a team. We have a guidance from a se senior advisor, Ken Dolsky from Empower New Jersey. And our goal is to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions from New Jersey buildings. That gas, the gases contribute currently 26% of all New Jersey uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We have several sub teams and I invite you to join. If you're an activist, we want you. And if you have interest in any of these four areas, join us. Uh, the first area is focusing on, on Governor Murphy and the administrative offices related to building electrification. That's the BPU, the DEP, and the code enforcement area of, of Department of Community Affairs. And they develop regulations and rules. The second team is a legislative, the legislative team that's working with New Jersey legislators and staff to develop legislation. We have our first meeting uh, next month, uh, mid-May. mid, mid -May. And we also have a team that helps run our monthly webinar. So this is the sixth of our webinars on uh, heat pumps and building electrification. It's the third Thursday of each month. If, you're, if, you're, if you have things to share, if you're a homeowner that has switched to heat pumps, we'd like to know your story. So you're welcome to come and participate or to help us run this and choose people. Also, we're working with a, a consultant to help New Jersey create a zero energy building code roadmap. Uh, so that we'll have new buildings that will be either zero energy ready or zero energy in the future. And also rehabs, uh, rehab, rehab uh, buildings would also so the way to get to this team to sign up is this short URL. Uh, this set of slides will be distributed within two or three days, and uh, uh, you can have, you'd be able to um, to click on these links and join, or just copy this down. 
sorry. So next slide. Uh, these are the background laws and regulations that guide us. And one of these documents is called the 80 by 50 report. It identifies the, all the sources of greenhouse gases in New Jersey and the top three are shown here. Here's a little more about those top three. Transportation is 42%, uh, buildings are 26%, and electricity generation is 19%. Uh, of course, electricity is used within houses and you want to try to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions from the electricity that you're using. So our, um, our move, the move in New Jersey to EVs is occurring rapidly. There's a lot of publicity. Uh, New Jersey's on the bandwagon with charging, building charging stations and incentives for EVs, for instance. But there's very little movement to reduce emissions from buildings. And we believe New Jersey needs movement to reach the governor's goal of 50% reduction by 2030. So we looked at the current projections and New Jersey leaves something to be desired here. This is from the report card, the, the 50 by 2030 report from 2019. So if we plot the gap, we've where New Jersey is, is this dotted, small dotted line here that's sort of leveling off. And where we want need to be by the 50 by 30, governor executive decree is right there. And that gap is on the order of 13, mega, uh, 13 million metric tons. Uh, where you look at it, it could be anywhere between eight and, uh, eight and 15 metric tons, it's a lot. Uh, and it's getting worse, in fact. These, and this is even after applying all of these policies that the governor has put in place. <clears throat> so I wanted to, that's enough of the high level stuff, but I wanna to shift to what you can do for your home. The Energy Master Plan promotes energy and conservation. And I highly recommend everyone taking advantage of nice discounts. So right now, for instance, you can schedule your own low cost subsidized energy assessment of your home. If you're one of those people in those towns, you can have a $49 energy audit. If you're uh, others, it's $99. <clears throat> and the link to have this happen for your house is this. I'd like to tell you, tell you my own experience and I highly recommend it. So three years ago, I did this program as part of as sponsored by the green team in my town and signed up for a $49 <clears throat> energy audit. It was three hours of an assessment. I mean, a really tremendous going in my house from top to bottom. Uh, the, uh, the person was very experienced. He used a, a fan in a sealed door in my house to create a small vacuum and looked for leaks, leaks with his thermal imaging camera. He, he took photos. Um, I also marked all the spots that he commented on with blue masking tape so I could quickly find them later. There were a lot. And I, I chatted with him about what I should be doing to fix different things as he uncovered them. Uh, much to some of my surprise, I've, he found two safety hazards, serious things in my house. Uh, the first was in the basement, uh, there was an overhead main air duct that was falling and I just never had noticed. The brackets had come loose from rafters. Uh, so we quickly propped it up we didn't want it falling on people's heads. And also he discovered that the water heater was set too hot. And, and so he lowered it to under 20 degrees, which is a natural. I really kicked myself that I didn't, under, didn't discover these. So at the end of this big survey of my house, including checking all sorts of things, <clears throat> he offered, they offered a standard process to send it out to uh, contractors to get it fixed. Uh, I elected to do things myself. I knew what they were. I had the photos. I had my blue tape and I had his advice and I just went to town. <clears throat> so uh, one of the things that was pretty obvious that he's pointed out is my attic stairs leaked air. And if, in fact, this thing is uninsulated. And, and so by going to, to um, Home Depot, I bought this insulated canopy that sits over the, and is sealed in the edges with caulk. It's zipper. Uh, zippers all the way around. And so, oh, uh, and so the thing is a little bit of insulation, highly silvered. So it's an air barrier plus an insulator, a very fast thing, less than $100. Uh, 
that I put into my attic. And then into my attic, I made sure everything is well insulated. He measured my thicknesses and whatnot. Um, so everything in the house was assessed and I knew what I needed to do. Now, I'd love to have solar on my house, but this is a view of my house at high noon. We have these 50 foot or even taller trees all around us. So an hour or two later, my house is in shadows. And I just wish that I could do something, but I really have done things. So I created an electric website. I called it electric.smiller.org. It's all the things that homeowners can do to get uh, zero uh, greenhouse gas emission electricity. And um, the best investment is really to install solar. And there's several ways to do it. Um, and in New Jersey, we're very fortunate. We now have community solar projects that are taking off. And uh, very shortly, we're gonna have opportunities to buy into community solars around New Jersey. And typically the, the prices are like 10% less than you get from your local electric company. You can also ask your city or region to create a re renewable government energy aggregation program. Um, and a number of cities around the state, around us have uh, planned to do that. Uh, I do maintain a, a long list of suppliers. Every, I update every two or three months and I, I uh, rank order by the lowest to highest price. So if you wanted to have a green supplier, I encourage you to come to my website. That's this website right here. Uh, but a warning, in the last several months, prices have been historically really, really high for renewable. I have no idea why. Well, the previous five years, I got a five or 10% discount and on the electric compared to my local utility, but the prices now are high. I would advise you to wait up, <laughs> join a community solar first and wait for the prices to come back down. But I will continue to keep up the screen supplier list. <clears throat> uh, one of the things we did very quickly was to add a new power panel. My power panel was literally filled with all these breakers. I even had double things up. You can have two in one. And every one of them was now filled up with two in one. And I needed more. So I had installed a second breaker panel. I have a two amp, 200 amp service in my house. I just needed more room for those panels. So now I'm all set for all the additional things I'm gonna be putting into my house to electrify my house. We have an older hybrid vehicle, Camaray hybrid, that gets 42 miles per gallon, which is pretty good, but nothing like this plug-in Prius Prime. Uh, we have gotten 163 miles per gallon equivalent, over 40,000 miles since we bought this car. Uh, most of our driving is within the 30 mile battery range. I see my wife here with my grandson and she drove this car, made it most of the way to our our daughter's house, and now is babysitting our, our uh, grandson. And now is charging there, the car for the drive back later on. Now I wanna switch gears to discuss my favorite topic, which is heat pumps. And this is a little map that shows heat pumps. Um, the heat pump itself is basically a, an air conditioner, and it has a few hundred dollars more parts in it to make it a, a heat pump. Uh, the, the parts allow the Freon inside to go backwards. So instead of heating or cooling, it can switch back and forth. And it works with the existing furnace, the existing, uh, there's a coil here that takes the Freon and exchanges heat. So this is the heat pump operation and cooling, and this is the heat pump operation and heating. Um, a very simple difference, they just reverse the direction inside this unit. And this would represent a central duct heating system. So the next one is very, very similar thing. Same outdoor sized compressor, it can be reversed or forward and it's connected via free end pipes but to a little unit on the wall that then is the evaporator that delivers hot air in the winter and cold air outside. Now the heat pump itself is not generating heat all it's doing is, is, is um, pumping Freon. And it's a Freon, this magical fluid, man-made fluid that is, is, is moving the heat from the outdoors to in inside or from inside to outside. Uh, problem with the Freon is it's very polluting. 
Ken is going to talk later about the hazards of methane. Well, all the variants of freons are much more potent. And we really are concerned and need to get this down. The ultimate is to have these things using CO2, in, which is a hazard of one. <laughs> so the first thing I did was I, I converted my fossil fuel gas pool heater to a heat pump. This is a, a, an air to water heat heat pump. And our future basement water heater is going to be the same thing, an air to water heat pump. And that probably it's going to happen once I start developing leaks in that water heater in the basement. <clears throat> so uh, back in December, four, four months ago, I, I went out for bid on replacing my, pro my, my project was to replace only one of my two air conditioners with a heat pump. My plan was to find a way to just swap the heat pump in, nothing else, replace the air conditioner, and reuse everything else. This is the gas furnace and the, um, the blower motor here. And uh, here's a Freon tube into the thing. And, and this, in here, there's a coil that exchanges heat. I wanted to reuse everything. Now, even in the end, I was able to do that. And I, in fact, even reusing my thermostat for my house. And about the only difference you see here is it's standing on top of stilts, because in the winter, you can't let snow drifts block those grills. You want to, you need all the ventilation you can get. Otherwise, very, very similar. And I chose the same manufacturer because the same manufacturer, things all work together properly. So uh, last summer, my daughter and my wife is at her house now, uh, uh, put on a, an addition, of this addition right here, needed to have heat. I uh, met with the contractor and he talked about, he knew about heat pumps because every evening he would study the literature and uh, he was up to speed on the latest technology and he recommended uh, this heat pump, which is Fujitsu. He said this was really highly rated, high potency. And uh, so they installed that uh, before the, before the ceiling and everything was put up there above the ceiling, they put the air handler above the ceiling. And the only thing you see in the ceiling is the register. Uh, if it's an older construction, you add this heat pump to the a mini split uh, heat pump to a room, you typically put the unit on the wall. So you'd, you'd see it. Uh, this brought to mind something else that I could do. There is now uh, several manufacturers of do-it-yourself heat pumps. Uh, when I tell this to people in the industry, they really frown on it, but it's possible. There, there is a company called Mr. Cool. It has a line of actually highly rated do-it-yourself mini split units. Uh, reviewers say they can be installed in as little as half a day. Uh, all the components come pre-pressurized with R410A Freon. So when you connect the pipe to the outside unit and to the inside unit, uh, it breaks the seal and then everything equalizes in pressure. So that's still a possibility. My daughter has a cold room added on by previous owners long ago. And, and the, the um, heating cooling in that room is atrocious. It's a long, very long duct and it's always cold in the winter. It's their family room. So I thought I would surprise them someday and plop in a do-it-yourself heat pump. It's possible and it's like $1,700 to do that room. <clears throat> Now, the, the, the heat pump that I did put in, I just saw, actually cost me, oh, about $4,900 total installed. Um, the prices of the things of the wholesale are pretty low. I actually shopped around and found two wholesalers who would deliver it to my house for $1,900. Uh, I liked to have somebody install it because they knew what they were doing, and I sure don't. Now, I'm going to give you another example of, of the effects of heat pumps. And this is, happens to be my church. And it's a 20 year history of the church putting in uh, higher and higher efficiency things within the church. Uh, they started out with this green sanctuary program, did an energy audit, which gave them ideas. Every year they did things like install a, a programmable thermostat, a small solar system was put on. Uh, they added insulation where needed. A big thing was to always replace uh, lights with LED versions. They did all this for the longest time. And it was only in the last year up to right now 
that you see a huge change, and I'll show you the data in a second. A big thing was to add heat pump um, heat pumps instead of their gas furnaces, and to put on a humongous solar system on the roof. I was part of the solar committee, so I know a lot about this. And so I plotted for the very first time from all the bill receipts we had, the total annual pounds of CO2 equivalent emissions. Starting 2003, 140,000 pounds per year, uh, slowly dropping with time. Uh, one event here was about a year, they went to a wind, uh, wind farm that uh, provided uh, renewable electricity. They found that when the contract was renewed, it was much higher, so they dropped that contract. But you can see during that time, the emissions dropped way down and then built back up. Uh, the, I guess the contract extended a little bit to the next year. And, but, but it's slowly going down here till fine, and then COVID interfered. But finally, with these two big changes, so moving to a heat pump and moving to uh, the big solar array, the, I estimated uh, based on where we're going, that, that we're going to be in the end net zero. In fact, we will be negative. We'll be negative emissions because there's trees around us that are sequestering carbon, including the sequestration, they are negative. Isn't that amazing? But what it took to make this huge change here was to go to heat pumps and, and go to this uh, large solar array to replace all their electricity with solar. So my, my take on this is that, that you need to go for the big things. Um, I'm going to show you what, what the big things really mean. So they actually replaced six gas furnaces. Here's three of them, and here's the new furnaces. Uh, the contractor chose to use gas as a backup at low temperatures. So it's brand new gas, and inside here is a coil and the, uh, the air, purif air purifier. And so there's, uh, what, six of these things scattered around. And the, uh, the solar array is uh, covering just about every square foot that we can find for a big solar panel. Uh, this is on the best roof and a, a lower roof. Uh, so 105 to 110 panels. I don't quite remember how many, but there's a lot up there. So it took those two big things to make that huge difference in emissions after, after 20 years of work. Think of that. So, I'm going to take you to the next step, and uh, I'm going to show you how you can determine your own house energy efficiency or the ability of your house to retain heat. And, and I'll take you step by step, but it's actually going to be really simple. In the end of this, you'll be able to predict, would a heat pump help me? How would it affect my house? You can actually predict it from what I'm going to show you. So if you go to your gas account, open it, look at history. If you find a, a big gas bill for one month this last winter, for instance, and this is my own, uh, the read date was December 23rd, 2021. Uh, there were 570 degree days in that month. And I used 147 therms of, that's uh, each therm is 100,000 BTU. So a lot of heat. I use a lot of heat for my house of gas burning to keep my house warm. Um, the reading was actual, and I chose this because the reading before was actual. So I had the actual, the actual, actual readings of the gas consumption. <clears throat> and then the second thing you need to do is to look at your existing furnace or boiler efficiency. And you can find it on the nameplate. You might have to open up the bottom, the front panel, but just record the output rating and the input rating. And that ratio is the efficiency. Or a simple thing to do. It's good enough probably for this. Assume if it's 10 years old, it's 90% efficient. If it's 20 years old, it's 80% it's efficient. Uh, that may be, in fact, that may be all you need to do. And <clears throat> this is the math. However, I have shortcuts. All you need to do is this equation right here. You know therms. You know degree days from that data. You know your furnace efficiency. And now you have calculated your house BTU loss per hour at 20 degrees Fahrenheit using this equation right here with that magical number. And with that magical number, 
I encourage you to take a look, to take blank templates of something I'm just going to show you in a second. And you're going to mark two points, draw a straight line. Uh, the bottom point is a certain spot, spot on the graph. The top point is the thing you just calculated. And it's going to look something like this red line. This is my own house. This is my heat load of my house. And it shows that at a temperature of 20 degrees, I will be losing 43,000 BTU per hour. That sounds like a lot. And this shows one particular heat pump. It shows it's a carrier 25 ENA model, and it shows at maximum speed that thing will be able to produce this level. And at minimum speed, when it's barely heard, you can, it's going that way down here. Uh, so it's very quiet. But I'm concerned about the maximums. There's something called a balance point. That's the point where as the temperature goes down, that heat pump cannot keep up, cannot deliver enough heat for my house, and my house will get cold. And that occurs here at 32 degrees, or 30, 34, 34 degrees, sorry. Uh, keep, sorry, so 34 degrees, or maybe 33 degrees, with the whole house. Now, my house is a two-story, um, uh, with a, internally has a huge foyer that uh, allows air to circulate between the first floor and second floor. Uh, I have two independent systems, uh, for one for each floor. But it turns out, because air circulates, I can replace only, I can use only the bottom furnace. And what this tells me, and I, I estimated this green thing, and it turned out to be really close. This tells me that with this heat pump, I can heat the house. Well, first of all, I can heat the whole house by the bottom unit alone. And, and I can heat the house to a temperature of about eight, seven, 19 degrees, 18 degrees Fahrenheit as the temperature drops, only the first floor alone. So what I can do with my new heat pump, if it meeting these specs is um, <clears throat> from these two curves, I know what the house performance would, would be. Um, did that make sense to you all? <laughs> but this is the magic, this plot, does the math for you and figures out what's going to happen. If you try another heat pump and map it on here, you're going to say, oh, I see how it works. Uh, you know, Carrier probably prides himself on being a cold weather heat pump. It oper actually operates down here to zero degrees or to five, minus five degrees close to it. It produces 20,000 BTU. But that's absolutely no help to me because it's nowhere near the heat I need. It might as well not be there. And so that's one thing you learn real fast by looking at different. So I, I looked at several heat pumps. Uh, the one I chose is this thing, which is my $4,900 heat pump. Instead of the carrier probably was on the order of 15,000. And the reason it's high is because it uses proprietary signaling between all the pieces. So, and you gotta have this carrier for the outside unit, the inside unit, the blower fan motor controller, and the thermostat. And so it ends up being a lot of money. This, so I'm doing the same thing here with my low price Ream RP1436. Here we have the same identical balance point, just happened to be same balance point for heating my whole house. So this expensive thing, four times the cost, and my cheaper one does the same thing in heating the, my whole house. Uh, also the balance point, here for this ream is, uh, it says it's on the order of 24 degrees. Uh, I did buy it, had it installed, and the actual balance point was closer to 20 degrees. And in practice, what I'm letting it do is drop to 18 degrees where it turns on my gas furnace as a backup. And I, I don't fully understand why that is, except the house has a lot of momentum. It's slow to heat, slow to cool, if the heat drops, if the temperature drops outside overnight, comes back up the next day, you don't even feel it. You don't, and sometimes you don't even know. So it's possible to go down to a really low point where you go to your backup fossil fuel, or it could be uh, vendors tend to want to put in the direct um, electrical wiring, um, heating grids instead of for a backup, which is very inefficient. It's like having baseboard electric heater. Uh, coefficient of performance is one. 
uh, versus this heat pump at its lowest temperature here has a coefficient performance of 2.54. Um, up here above these balance points, it has a coefficient of performance up to 3.6. And so it turns out that around a 2.9 coefficient of performance is roughly the same price right now of using my fossil fuel gas furnace, D thousand, and a 2.9 uh, heat pump. So I would end up saying most of the most of this is slightly more expensive than having gas. All of this is significantly cheaper than having gas. And so I'm still looking at my electric and gas bills. You might have questions. Well, what's the result? Well, I'm waiting for a heat season to tell you uh, how I came out on this equation. So that's my little story of what everybody can do. The very last page of this package of slides are blank balance point diagrams like this. And you can plot your own heat pumps if you want to see what would happen. And you can predict what can happen. So my last slide actually is this. I'm just repeat with more detail of what each of our teams are doing in our, our building 50 by 30 building electrification team. We have the administration team working with the governor and the various agencies. We have a legislative sub team working with the senators and the assemblymen. Uh, we have a very small group of people that is working on the third Thursday of each month having our webinar. You're welcome to join us or help manage it. And finally, we're working with an organization that's consultant to, uh, to the BPU that is forming a New Jersey Zero Energy Building Code Roadmap. And our interest here is to driving the building, how drive the building code so that the new buildings in New Jersey are zero energy or zero energy ready as soon as we can. And even the rehab buildings, the same thing. We'd like to get them so that they're very efficient. And then you can use really inexpensive heat pumps to keep your house warm. And if you want more information, uh, the six webinars are all, including this one, all but be, be at this location. And uh, you'll see this when you get the slide uh, later on. And uh, I put a little slide about myself. I am a, a lead or co-lead, chairs, a very a, several different organizations, a number of organizations. In fact, this is not everything I, <laughs> I participate in. And here's your balance point chart. Just make copies of this and see what happens. And it's very, very simple directions. So the directions are all here. Any questions? This has been the end of my talk. I hope that I educated you on what's possible. There, there's a bunch in the chat, Steve. Oh, I can't. OK, sorry, I haven't looked. 22? <laughs> OK. And I just like to mention that uh, on the um, uh, presentations that you've uh, posted with that link, um, viewers are uh, encouraged to view the uh, um, March 17th um, heat pump. Uh, it's an hour, hour and a half of really, really thorough information. You guys did a great job in that presentation. Yeah, yeah, so we had, um... On the 13th, the last uh, month, we had a, a series of speakers. I don't know, there were probably four or five. And everybody had their own story. And we have architects come on and builders come on. And I mean, we have HVAC contractors. Uh, we have all sorts of people and uh, try to tell the story of building electrification. And we're doing that every month. If you'd like to help, if you'd like to uh, have somebody come on, just let us know. Oh, here, Mr. Cool, do it yourself. That's right. I'm, I'm looking through the messages. <clears throat> what kind of price are these heat pumps? Um, what do they cost? I've seen I've seen charts, but I don't have anything at hand. And I, I wish I needed to. Uh, what kind of price are the heat pumps? The do it yourself heat pumps? Is that the question? Uh, Mr. Cool. Yeah, the price would be like for my, my daughter's house, uh, 
I could uh, install one for about $1,700. So that's pretty cheap. Oh, how do the church finance the solar panels? Well, good question. Uh, for most, most of our big expenses, we've actually had donors. And uh, this Sunday, we're going to award a plaque to the donor who uh, awarded it in memory of his sister who had died. So that, and we have other, other things like that. Uh, your generous donor finances. Uh, the payback period is very fast. Uh, it's actually just a few years. It's very attractive. Uh, we found a uh, we found a supplier for a church. If uh, looking at the moral church, um, how they finance it. Um, we found a supplier who was able to take the, all the tax credit himself, and uh, basically he owns it. But we have all the rights to it. We have the we've received the SREX. Uh, for the next seven years, and then he sells it to us basically for a dollar. So, um, we, although we had an upfront amount we had to pay, but it was very cheap compared to others. <clears throat> yeah, that's exactly right. Um, <clears throat> the The question is how to finance it. Yeah, it was through. Um, it was through uh, the AEPS was the the, the uh, HVAC contractor, and yes, uh, they. The, the the financing arrangement where they took the tax credits was handled through their organization, and uh, it's, it's very legitimate. They took the uh, all the write-offs, and uh, because the church has no advantage, we can't use the write-offs. How to do this if you have oil heat? <clears throat> well, somebody is on the call, Greg Gorman, who has oil heat, and that behaves just like the gas furnace. And you can do the same sort of thing. Uh, Greg, if you're there, is Greg on the call? Uh, he could comment. Yeah, 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 I did mine. I, uh, JCPNL only gives the actual readings every three months. So based on the last uh, actual I got in uh, March, I estimated that I probably avoided burning 350 gallons of uh, oil. And uh, between the cost of oil at $3.25 a gallon that I used uh, the last time I bought it, and uh, comparing that with my electric bill, I think I saved $500. But then my neighbor just got a delivery the other day, and she paid $4.75 a gallon for uh, oil and uh so my savings is probably closer to maybe six close to 650 dollars but at that rate the the extra cost that i paid to get an air conditioner uh gonna be paid my my ex my heat pump uh allocation is probably gonna get paid off in two two and a half years if the cost of oil stays up and is it straightforward to replace your gas yeah, your oil it, burning like system I say, my, my uh i have a hybrid system and what they did is a uh it's an air so air source heat pump and the uh all they did was opened up the uh air ducts and uh, inserted the uh, coils and then uh, wired uh, had a google nest uh uh, replaced my thermostat. Uh, my uh, my circuit breaker didn't have to have any upgrades because it was it was relatively new. Uh, replaced that about 20, 25 years ago to to meet the codes back then. Uh, they put a little fuse box between you know right on the house by the. Uh, the, the pump itself, the heat pump, the air conditioner pump uh, with 25 amp. Uh, then they uh, hooked up the uh, wiring so that uh, at 15 degrees, my uh, heat pump turns off and it kicks on the oil. Anyway, it was, it was pretty good. It was relatively easy. It was, two men came in, had it done within uh, five hours. 
Now that includes the, the rewiring, the insertion of that, uh, you know, and then put it on doing some testing and whatnot. It was relatively easy. Thank you, Greg. So that's uh, the answer, I hope, to your question of um, how do you do it with an oil furnace? Yeah. There were a series of questions, um, and I just want to go th quickly through them. Uh, one is, uh, what do people who are less wealthy, low-income people, what do they do? And Sarah Fischel answered it correctly, that we're going to need New Jersey policies to get electrification happen for low-income homeowners. Other states around us uh, are doing a much better job of incentivizing uh, their their population and for this sort of thing, building electrification, but New Jersey has not yet really started. And, and so part of our proposals will be to try to make this available to everybody. There, there, was, a, <clears throat> there was a question about, does this work with the radiated heat? Uh, we discussed that a bit at the March 17th. And uh, in the Q&A for that, there was more discussion. Basically, there's no way to have heat pumps that work with high temperature heat. But yes, there are, a Daikin, I believe, is one uh, manufacturer that actually has ability to have high temperature, like 120 or a, a, a higher temperature than that, water circulated. Um, and, and one of the homeowners, in fact, had, had talked explicitly about how he did this in his house. So take a look at the March 17th. How does this work with radiated heat? Yeah, I think one of your I think one of your presenters on the 17th uh, described the strategies that he employed in order to uh, add these heat pumps at little or no cost, virtually no cost, I think is what he said. I don't remember, but something like that. It's hard to find no cost solutions, but go more power to him. Uh, the, another question is, how do you find good installers in Cumberland County? Well, um, I actually had a conversation uh, yesterday or today with one of our members of uh, building electrification He's an employee of the New Jersey Clean Energy Organization. And uh, he's pointed out that they used to have lists of installers of heat pumps, uh, but he doesn't know of any right now. Uh, and, uh, and then I think other people like Greg, almost, anyway, we have some lists of installers, but, uh, but our contact, Hap Haven, is actually going to be checking out to see if maybe they should put out a survey now to get some replies of people, installers, who are familiar with heat pumps. Um, is then the, another question was, at what outdoor temperature are the heat pumps good until? Is it a temperature where it's too cold for heat to pump to work? Uh, I believe they work down to minus 15 or even below. Uh, the chart, last chart I had showed that heat pump working down to minus five. That was the, that was, that was the, uh, if, uh, the 25 VN A36, 33 ton heat pump that was doing fine down to generating 20,000 BTU at minus five. So yeah, they keep working. The question is, is your house suitable? Because you need enough, enough insulation so you're not losing all that heat. So, yeah, so that's the chart with that curvy line. Yes, yeah. Uh, I can put it back up if that would help. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is the chart with the, the curvy line. Uh, this was a, uh, a carrier. This is the maximum output as a function of about that temperature down here. Here's zero degrees. Here is minus five. So you can see that it actually goes down in the negative territory. And, and uh, there are others that go on way down, like minus 15. So yes, they do exist. Uh, the other thing that's happening is, um, is uh, the, the New Jersey DP, uh, no, actually United States EPA will have a special class of cold weather heat pumps this coming year in 2023. And so you'll just choose one of those and, and uh, you'll find ones that go really down to very low temperatures. There had been a hand up, Steve, but I think it disappeared. Oh. <clears throat> Is there anybody else with a question? 
what I'd like to do is now turn the floor over to Ken. Um, I just heard Ken, by the way, at a hearing. <laughs> Uh, New York it was a New Jersey Senate Energy Committee you had a hearing and uh, Ken was there to testify today or probably on zoom but I don't know. Uh, he did a super job I thought but anyway the topic of uh, Ken's talk tonight is methane's extremely powerful role in global climate change and is a toxic gas in your home. I know many people's talked about your home can be very toxic with uh, gas burning. So uh, Ken it's your show. Okay, thank you. And that was in person. Oh, yes. My first trip to Trenton in a couple of years. I forgot how much I forgot how much I enjoyed those. <clears throat> uh, so um, I'll be able to probably run through this in about 10 or 15 minutes. And what we're going to do is, is uh, talk about what's behind all this shifting to heat pumps and uh, you know, clean, clean uh, energy solutions. And that's basically the fact that for the most part, we're using methane, uh, both to make uh, our electricity and to heat our homes. And as you can see from the, from the, the, uh, the bottom of the chart, uh, Steve, you could have done this as well, but I just wanted to warn everybody there are some mathematical calculations, and if you want, I can alert you before this is discussed in case uh, you know you want to cover your eyes and ears. And if you have little children, you can you know have them uh, move out of the room. Um, oh, let me okay so convert this to uh, all right. So um, a lot of you understand that methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. And you've heard that from the uh, environmentalists, you've heard it from the EPA, but I don't know how many people really understand uh, what that means and, and how to compare the different greenhouse gases in terms of their potential uh, global warming power. So first let's just run through uh, what are the greenhouse gases and there's not that many of them. Uh, you're familiar with, with carbon dioxide. It's by far the most plentiful. Um, the next most plentiful but uh, very powerful gas is methane, which is uh, carbon and the four hydrogen uh, atoms. Uh, then nitrous oxides. And then a whole category of fluorinated gases. And that's what Steve was talking about when he said Freon. And you can see the list down at the very bottom. And uh, some of these, uh, with the, they vary tremendously in, in uh, lifetimes and global warming power, and I'll give you some examples of them. Uh, but they're mercifully, uh, you know, it's a small volume of fluorinated gases compared to uh, methane and CO2. Then there's black carbon uh, or soot. And so it's not really a gas, but it is formed when uh, gas is burned. And uh, it is a very, very powerful uh, greenhouse gas. And lastly is water vapor. And it's not really something that we make an effort to control because I think it's largely uncontrollable. But uh, I'll share some information uh, coming up on how much of our, our uh, climate change impact, how much global warming is actually due to water vapor. So here's the uh, EPA's uh, view for 2020 of the actual uh, excuse me, well, I should say actual, of the amount of these different types of greenhouse gases in terms of what's called CO2 equivalent. And if you look on the right side here, uh, that's what they're talking about. So it's uh, for the US, um, like almost 6 billion metric tons, 5,981 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent, which means that each of these other gases, methane, nitrous oxide, and fluorinated gases have been converted so that to a value so that they can be added together with the carbon dioxide. And each one of them you know, is, is shown in terms of how powerful it is or, or how much of global warming it, it uh, creates compared to carbon dioxide. And they exclude the land sector, unlike uh, Steve's church, which includes, uh, or, your, or your home, whatever it is, um, that takes into account the amount of uh, carbon that's being sequestered from the air by, by trees 
Uh, this does not include that as a, as, as a countermeasure, which I believe is the correct way to do it. What we really have to do is get rid of greenhouse gases. And uh, while planting forests will help us tremendously, uh, we need to keep our eye on how much actual real greenhouse gas there is in the atmosphere, uh, not how much is being uh, sequestered by carbon, by uh, forests. And then, uh, you know, NOAA has been tracking each of these. And so I just wanted to put this up so you can see how, how things are going. Uh, I, I think the only, the, the last date they had was 2020. Uh, but I'm sure for the, for the carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane, uh, that those curves haven't changed. In fact, the methane curve looks like it's starting to, to go, uh, you know, uh, in a, in a nonlinear uh, direction. You know, it's becoming exponential in terms of, you know, how this, how this, this curve is starting to trend upward. And you can see that the uh, hydrocarbons, the, excuse me, not the uh, fluorocarbons, um, have gone up and down. Um, and I think, unfortunately, some of them are now heading back up. So uh, that is a problem, but that's not something I can address tonight. So there's three major different differentiators among these greenhouse gases. The first is how long it stays in the atmosphere. And uh, it varies. Some things are uh, can be measured in days and other gases will stay for centuries. And um, when we say how long it stays in the atmosphere, uh, at some point it's either, it either it decays or it's absorbed into the ocean or it's absorbed by plants in terms of you know, in se sequestration. And so when methane decays, it combines with ozone and it decays into CO2 and water. So it doesn't actually go away as a greenhouse gas, but it becomes a much less potent greenhouse gas in the form of uh, CO2. Uh, the second factor is this global warming potential. And the global warming potential was developed, as I said, to allow comparisons of the global warming impacts of different gases. And the definition that I used here talked about a measure of how much energy the emission of one ton of the gas will absorb uh, over, you know, relative to the emissions of one ton of carbon dioxide doesn't have to be one ton. It could be one, one molecule, it could be one ounce, it could be a million tons. It's just the idea that you're comparing equal weights of, uh, you know, of, of this gas to a equal weight of carbon dioxide. And so the global warming power is simply a number, like the value could be 10. And then that means that the gas is 10 times more potent than CO2. So CO2 is the standard and it has a global warming power as you'll see of one and everything else is measured relative to, this, to, to CO2. Um, then the third, which is really the third aspect, um, which as you saw on the, on the uh, chart before is basically how much of the volume, you know, how, much is, how, much, how much of that greenhouse gas are we dealing with? Uh, sometimes it's measured in parts per million and I believe that was the way it was shown um, on, on these charts. Uh, but generally when we're doing these conversions and looking at the equivalents, uh, we use metric tons. And a metric ton is 2,200 US pounds. It's also written sometimes as T-O-N-N-E-S. I guess that's the, the British way of doing it. But it's abbreviated MM, it's usually MMT is million metric tons. So uh, let's look at the, the uh, five or six greenhouse gases and let's look at their lifetimes and the global warming powers. So carbon dioxide has a lifetime of hundreds of years. Carbon does, or carbon, carbon dioxide does you know, enter the ocean and it's emitted by the ocean, but uh, the average life you know, of a molecule of carbon dioxide is that it stays in the atmosphere for hundreds of years with about 20 to 25% of it remaining there forever, unless we do something to actually uh, sequester it and pull it out of the atmosphere. And like I said, it has a global warming power of one. Methane, uh, the good news on methane is that it decays fairly rapidly by comparison and that eight to 12 years, an average of 10, 10 years, um, you know, it, it decays into CO2 and, uh, you know, and water. Um, but it has a very, very high global warming power. So 
at 10 years, it has a global warming power of 104. If we took a 20 year average, it's a value of 86. And for the 100 year uh, view, it's, it has a value of 25. And those numbers are really key to what we're gonna talk about shortly. And uh, the question is who uses what numbers and, and what are the right numbers to use? And uh, there's no agreement on that. And uh, that's where we get into trouble actually measuring and understanding the impact of methane. Uh, nitrous oxides are about 120 years and they vary obviously here, you know, 265 to 298. The fluorinated gases are all over the place, 13 years to 50,000 years, this, you know, little range there. Um, and you can see that, you know, here the, some of them will vary at the 100 year level between 6,000 and 7,000 GWP, the 20 year level uh, it drops down to an average of 4,800 to 40 to 4,900. Um, I put down at the bottom here, the you know, carbon tetrafluoride, for example, is the one with a lifetime of 50,000 years. Um, if you're interested, Wikipedia has got a great uh, story on these and you can dig into the uh, fluorinated gases you know, to your heart's content <laughs> looking at Wikipedia. Uh, the thing with water vapor that I found very really interesting was that it accounts for about 60% of climate change. Uh, and it has a very, 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 very low global warming power. You can look at these numbers. Uh, but it's the, it's the fact that there's so much of it multiplied by these very, very small global warming powers that uh, gives it a tremendous influence over climate change. But as I said, it's not a man-made uh, you know, gas, although uh, you know, your use of water by humans and irrigation, et cetera, does contribute to water vapor but it's not something that we generally uh, look at as, as something that we want to control in order to fight climate change. All right, so here's your first warning. Here's a little bit of math coming up. So how do we compute this, va this, this value of CO2 equivalent that allows uh, the impact of all these greenhouse gases to be measured on the same scale and allows you to add them up? So uh, the formula is, you take the tons, the metric tons, I should have said here, of greenhouse gas, multiply it by the global warming power, and that gives you tons of CO2E equivalent. And so I have an example here. If you had five tons of CO2 and three tons of methane, then the total CO2E is five tons of, methane, of uh, CO2 times its global warming power of one, plus three tons of methane times, in this case, I use the global warming power of 86, which is the 20 year value. And you do the math, it comes out to 263 million metric tons of CO2E. So it's really not that complicated. What gets a little, well, we'll, we'll get to it. What gets a little more complicated is um, going back and looking at those numbers from the EPA and changing the GWP and reevaluating how much methane we're really dealing with. So the controversy over the global warming power of methane is that uh, the IPCC, EPA, and the DEP, because the DEP follows the EPA, have been using the global warming power value of 25, which is the 100-year lifetime average. And uh, we have argued that that's nonsense when we have, uh, you know, between now and 2030, and then maybe between 2030 and 2050, uh, as the critical time frames to reduce greenhouse gases, that we should use measures that are, say, 20 or 25 years uh, in time, terms of time horizon, which would give us much higher values because, you know, as I said, the the 20 year value was 86. And so the argument is, if you're gonna take action in a short period of time, you wanna use the global warming power that's appropriate for that period of time. So you have an idea of what the hell you're doing and you can make better decisions on, on how to address these different greenhouse gases. So the value of 25, and I read somewhere and I looked for it and I couldn't find it again uh, to, uh, use in this presentation, but the value of 25 uh, was settled on by the IPCC because they were trying to deal with people who wanted to, value, who wanted to use 10 years and others that wanted to use up to 1,000 years. 
Um, and the IPCC, uh, especially uh, you know, when it first got started, was looking at um, you know, what's the effect of global warming uh, 100 years to the future. And so they picked the value of 25. However, they said that it's just a value judgment as to whether that's the right value for whatever it is that you're trying to manage or you're trying to analyze. And so again, uh, we think it should be 20. So, uh, you know, since global warming value has a tremendous influence over the volume of greenhouse gas, uh, we're arguing we should use a value that represents the time period in which we're taking action. And uh, some people in New Jersey in the legislature, like Ann Assemblyman Zwicker, agreed with that. And uh, Lyle Rawlings, who's one of the, he's like the godfather of solar in New Jersey, agreed with that. And so Assemblyman Zwicker led an effort uh, in the, you know, in the 20 teens to get past the law requiring the use of a 20 year value of 86 so that we have a more accurate estimate of what the, what the methane impact is on global warming in New Jersey. So two years ago, this, this law was passed, it was signed. Uh, by the governor, and the DEP, I believe, has written a regulation because, you know, you really have to understand that laws can be passed, but until regulations are written to enact them, uh, nothing happens. And that's what happened with the Global Warming Response Act. It was passed in 2007, and because Chris Christie didn't want anything to happen, he told the DEP, don't do anything. And without regulations describing exactly how you should proceed, nothing gets done. And so it's been two years, and I think the DEP has finally written a regulation uh, to describe how to use this. And it's not very hard. Um, and Governor Murphy has not signed it yet. So uh, that's the kind of progress we've, <laughs> we've made in New Jersey on this issue. So another warming. Uh, you know, this is a, a red alert here that uh, we got a lot of math coming up. And if you want to just focus on the bottom line, uh, that's easy enough. But what we wanted to do was go back and look at the value that the EPA said uh, methane was in terms of the impact on you know, the total US uh, uh, you know, climate, uh, climate warming and um, look at the difference between using a value of 86 versus 25. So I'll run through this math, and if anybody you know, has any questions, we could talk about it, or we could do that offline. So the value that you saw in that chart was a total CO2e value of 5,981 million metric tons. And they said 11% of that was from methane. So 11% of the 5,900 is 658. And that's in terms of CO2e. Now we know that they used the global warming power of 25 to get that. And so they took the amount of methane in terms of tons, multiplied it by 25 and got 658. So now we divide 658 by 25, which tells us that the amount of methane that the EPA thinks, and by the way, this is probably lowballed by 100%. Uh, there's so many sources of methane that uh, you know it's 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 probably almost impossible, uh, especially if you don't make much of an effort uh, to actually understand how much methane is out there. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of um, old wells that are leaking, our stoves are leaking. Uh, you know, it 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 leaks from every element in the uh, whole distribution channel, from pumping it out of the ground uh, to burning it. Uh, so. I'm sure this number is terribly low, but let's just uh, for the moment give the EPA the benefit of the doubt. So uh, we figured out by dividing by 25 that we have actually 26 million metric tons of methane in 2020. Well, now we wanna use the global warming power of 86 to see how this really stacks up. So we take 86 times the 26.3, and this is the true CO2e as far as we're concerned, of 2,263 versus a 658. And so when we now plug this back in to look at what the total true CO2e is in the United States, we take the 5,981, that's the number that we got from the EPA, 
we take out the old value for methane of 658 and we plug in the new value of 2,263. And so lo and behold, we now have a value of 7,500 million metric tons compared to the 5,981. You know, so that's an increase of 27% just by you know, figuring out um, how to really count methane. And then if you look at that as a percentage of the total, so we've got 200, you know, 2,263 divided by the total of 756, we see that methane is actually contributing 30% of global warming, not the 11% that was in the uh, pie chart from the EPA. So that's what happens when you change the GWP value. And uh, I don't know if our friends in, you know, in uh, Murphy land really want to do that because it means that the numbers in the greenhouse gas inventory that the DEP has been giving us is going to have to go up by probably 30% or at least, you know, between 11, from 11% 11 up to 30%. Uh, and that means that we've emitted a lot more greenhouse gases than we thought, and we have to cut a lot more than we thought. So none of which is easy. So, um, you know, one of the effects of uh, methane leakage, and this is not burning methane, this is just methane leaking into the atmosphere. When methane gets burned, uh, we get carbon dioxide and we, under we understand that. Um, but uh, there have been some studies, particularly by Dr. Harworth at uh, Cornell, Howarth at Cornell, uh, and a study that was done in 2011 that basically said, you know, frac gas is worse than conventional gas, and that's worse than coal, and that's worse than oil. So frac gas is really a, a, a worse greenhouse gas than what you get from all of these other fossil fuels. And the PSC Healthy Energy uh, organization basically estimated that if you have a methane leakage of 2.8 percent of what you bring out of the ground that at that level the greenhouse gas emissions are worse from gas than they are from coal so when people tell you well you know gas is a clean burning uh, fuel and coal is dirty okay that's not talking about the greenhouse gas emissions that's talking about the uh, you know the air pollutants you talk about greenhouse gas emissions, gas is a lot worse than coal if you're only at 2.8%. And basically, we think it's higher than that. So, um, so if we have, um, the good thing about, about uh, methane in a way is that um, having a high global warming power and a short lifetime means that if you can control it effectively, you can make tremendous strides in reducing global warming. Because every, every you know, removing a molecule of methane is 86 times more effective than removing a, you know, a molecule of CO2. So you get a tremendous you know, amount of bang for the buck by uh, you know, removing methane rather than removing CO2. Uh, the 2018 IPCC report Agreed, cutting methane, black carbon, and other super pollutants vastly increases the chances of staying below one and a half degrees centigrade. And the likelihood that we'll reach the warming threshold is dependent upon these emission pathways of non CO2 pollutants, such as methane and black carbon. So uh, it's really, 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 really important that we focus on methane. And that's um, part of what the, uh, some of what the EPA proposed rule uh, that you may have heard Biden announce a couple of months ago uh, to cut methane by 30% uh, is a big deal. And uh, that will have you know, much, much more impact, like I said, than uh, any, any CO2 reductions, unless they were, you know, like orders of magnitude larger. And the IEA, which is the International Energy Agency, you know, not exactly a uh, environmental uh, organization, uh, they agreed. They said tackling methane emissions from fossil fuel up represents one of the best near-term opportunities for limiting the worst effects of climate change because of its short-lived nature and the large scope for cost-effective abasement. So uh, everybody seems to be in agreement. You know, now we just have this tiny little issue of actually doing something. Uh, switching gears just real fast uh, to talk about the health effects 
uh, which is what you really have to be concerned about if you're using gas appliances. Uh, as with most other air pollutants, uh, you get a, a wide variety of uh, symptoms and problems. And if you read the list here, vision, memory loss, nausea, vomiting, et cetera. Uh, if, you if you're in it, obviously you have enough uh, methane, uh, basically it'll make you, it'll, it'll kill you. Uh, that's rare, but um, you know, if you're in a, an environment, uh, if you're in an environment where you know it should never happen, but uh, if we start getting more LNG processed in this country and we have an LNG tank car derailment or something, uh, liquid natural gas becomes uh, it was basically methane. It's just so cold, it's compressed into liquid, but then it rapidly expands into uh, just you know, a concentration of gas, especially in a low-lying area. Uh, if you're driving through it or if you're living in that area, uh, you'd probably die because you'd be breathing that and uh, there'd be no way to uh, get away from it and get, get into uh, an oxygen environment. So the New Jersey health burden from, burdened from uh, outdoor air pollution directly related to combustion fossil fuels and building has been estimated that over 250 premature deaths and 2.8 billion in health impacts annually. And that's from the Acadia report that I am sure is on the uh, you know, on Steve's website uh, in terms of resources. And uh, some other, another statistic was children in homes with gas stoves have a 42% higher likelihood of asthma incidents. So methane is not our friend even though it uh, heats our homes today and a lot of it is being burned for electricity, we really need to get off it as soon as we possibly can. So uh, anybody has any questions? Uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, the most recent question uh, said, that is mind blowing, Ken. What are the most potent <clears throat> strategies for reducing methane emissions? Uh, well, as we, as we discussed or just presented to the uh, Environmental com uh, Committee, Senator Smith's committee uh, this morning, uh, the first rule is when you're in a hole, stop digging. And so there are seven, when, when we first started, when Power of New Jersey first started looking at uh, these new methane projects or gas projects, we found about 13 in 2019 and we estimated they, if they all got implemented, we increased our greenhouse gases by about 30%. Well, six of them got implemented and we ended up, we think with a 19% increase. And now there's seven more that are on the drawing boards. So the first thing to do is to stop, uh, stop new fossil fuel projects. That's power plants that run on uh, methane, uh, there's also uh, compressor stations that, that leak a lot that um, are associated with pipelines. We don't want to build any more pipelines that transport methane. Uh, we don't want to uh, allow New Jersey to be an exporter of liquefied natural gas uh, because we estimated, or the IEA estimated that 5% of all liquefied natural gas in a project leaks. And um, uh, the other, oh, so I think, so pipelines, compressor stations, and power plants are, are really, really big new projects. Uh, when you look at electrification of homes, uh, it's like three, three you know, four, four million point sources that uh, together, if you can clean them up, makes a tremendous difference. Uh, but not, as an individual, uh, you know, home, it's not good, you know, it, it doesn't make much difference. Not that it's not important to do, but if you want to make big changes. Uh, the other things to do uh, is uh, there are now satellites that will show us uh, leakage from storage uh, locations. Uh, the gas companies are promising to tighten up literally their uh, uh, joints and uh, places where gas leaks out of their infrastructure. Um, but that's really not, not, not enough. What we really have to do is, is get off gas completely. And the other, another, you know, we, we don't have this in New Jersey, but there are a lot of old uh, gas uh, uh, wells. 
that are leaking. I mean, I think it's like the hundreds of thousands. And um, they are all, uh, they add up to a significant, significant source of gas. Uh, another thing, it, just to go back to um, uh, compressor stations. I mean, not only do compressor stations, <laughs> compressor stations leak gas and other harmful uh, air pollutants, but every once in a while, when gas pressure builds up, they're allowed to just vent all the gas into the atmosphere. And so it doesn't happen all that often, but it's a tremendous uh, plume of gas that suddenly gets released. So uh, a lot of ways to go about it. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I don't think we're making enough of an effort at all in order to, you know, to do that. Meanwhile, you got the gas companies, and I was sitting there listening today to New Jersey Natural Gas, talk about how excited they are that they've got a project going where they're gonna uh, create green hydrogen and mix that with their gas to, you know, offset some of their gas in, and send it out into the pipeline. And that they also have a project going outside of New Jersey to take uh, uh, methane from, you know, animal farms and clean it up and be able to use that rather than taking, uh, you know, net, taking, quote, natural gas or frack gas out of the ground. So the, the gas industry is really, really feeling threatened by, uh, by us, by, by the building electrification team, and by all the efforts uh, that we keep screaming about to stop building gas uh, projects. And they're turning around and they're trying to find ways to keep gas, uh, you know, earning money for them. And uh, I really don't want to get too in detail into this, but this is a whole effort to use what they call renewable natural gas, RNG. And that includes taking gas from you know, animal waste or taking gas from landfills, uh, some you know, hydrogen, liquefied natural gas. And uh, their argument is that this gas or the methane that comes off of say landfills or, or, or animal waste uh, is renewable because the material that went into the landfill or the feed that went into the animals that you know ended up you know, emitting uh, methane uh, all came out of the atmosphere in terms of you know products or uh, feed for animals and things like that. And so it's just a cycle, and we're not actually taking more gas out of the ground. So you know, as with every uh, flim flam or every, every deceit, there's sometimes a little kernel of truth. And so, yeah, there is a little bit of truth in the fact that uh, the sources of those uh, uh, methods, those sources of methane do use uh, carbon that's already in the environment. But the problem is it perpetuates the rest of the uh, gas infrastructure. There's nowhere near enough gas coming off of uh, uh, landfills uh, to fulfill all, all the needs today. And so it has to be supplemented with gas that comes out of the ground. And so it just keeps that, that infrastructure going when what we really have to do is get rid of it and move as quickly as we possibly can to you know, solar and wind primarily as our uh, renewable energy sources. Any other questions? So there are Steve, questions. Yeah, uh, it's eight twenty-four. Do we want to continue the questions, or uh, do these offline, maybe, or what do people would like? What do people want to do? Uh, I'll tell you. Martin Levin had an interesting question. I thought, uh, what is the impact on global warming gases in when in the atmosphere when we fill our cars with gasoline? What is the gas that escapes? Uh, I expect the answer is like benzene escapes. Uh, yeah, it's hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons, benzene being, yeah. Being, being one of them. So mm. uh, it's not, you know, fluorocarbons. Um, and those were, were not really identified as being, uh, you know, impactful. Well, I mean, it's the carbon in those that's, that's probably the issue. And they probably break down pretty pretty quickly uh, in sunlight. 
or they are actually what they do is they, they combine with uh, nitrous oxide and they form smog or an ozone. So uh, the carbon is probably released uh, pretty, pretty quickly, but it forms ozone, which, which you know, has all kinds of health, health issues. So Martin had one other question, and um, it's pretty specific here. It says, Ken, it looks suspicious that the fluorinated gases impact goes up between 25 years and 100 years on your GWP chart. Yeah, I think there was an explanation for that, which I probably maybe have here. Um, the, the, the idea is that these cool gases last so long that uh, the longer the time frame, the higher the impact. It's very, very few of them, uh, you know, last only for 20 years. So I think, I think that was also explained in that article in Wikipedia. Okay, thank you. See, I think we've unlike, covered most of methane, this. you know, methane has a higher warming power for the short period because it dissipates, you know, it, it, it uh, uh, de decays in 10 or 15 years. The fluorinated gases just do the opposite. So they have higher global warming powers and, you know, for longer periods of time in the, in the, as you look out over the longer period. Well, all of this I find pretty alarming. <laughs> and you should. <laughs> we all should. Thank you very Bye. much. It's now almost 8.30. Uh, we're probably past our prime here. And I, Ken, we really appreciated your talk. Uh, it's possible we might want to answer questions afterwards. Uh, we could do that if we wanted to. Um, does anybody have any final question that you'd like us to answer? Yeah, I, I'm Jeff. Um, I'm listed um, under Ken because he was kind enough. So there's any way I can get in. I'm a little confused about one thing. Electrification right now involves if you're getting, you can get power from solar or you can get it from utility plant. You can get it from PSE and G, let's say. Right now, if somebody would some would would we encourage somebody to right now put in electrification even without solar because wind energy is on the comp. In other words, this seems to be a bit of a moving target, um, and I can't um, get my hands around it. Um, and if it's a dumb question, let me know. But I can see with electric vehicles. It pays to electrify even with the current mix of um, sources for electricity in in New Jersey, and then, and that would include gas, nuclear, the whole you know, renewables, the whole the whole mix, um, and that would result in a fifty percent savings or reduction in in, in in greenhouse gas emissions, as I understand it. So would we push electricity? regardless of whether someone uses solar or not in new construction, because wind, wind energy is on the comp. That's sort of the no. thought. Uh, the B, I, the, we've had this discussion in the past uh, with Mike Winka concerning um, the, uh, and he put, he's uh, put together a pretty good explanation in previous webinars. Um, they all, all these sources have to be coordinated. And, and that's an interesting thing you've raised. A very good question. Uh, you need to make sure the electricity, green, clean electricity is there when you need it, when you roll out these programs, or you may end up making things worse. And so that's a really good question. The worst meaning you'd, you'd be uh, drawing on peak or coal burning plants maybe to supply the electricity. That could happen if we're not careful. Thank you. Thanks, Ken, for both of you for just super presentations. Sure. Um, there's a question here about geothermal. Um, I would just say, uh, so A, you know, geothermal, I think you know, we need to be specific about what type of geothermal we're talking about. Uh, if it's geothermal where uh, there are places on the Earth's crust that 
are close to the closer, uh, that, that are thin, and therefore the magma from the core of the earth um, is close to the crust, and you can drill down through the crust and create a tremendous heat source that you could use, for example, to you know create steam in pipes as it goes through the magma, um, and then use that to power turbines or whatever. Um, that's one form, form of geothermal, and we don't have that in New Jersey. Uh, our crust is, we're too crusty. <laughs> we don't, uh, we aren't that close to the core. Uh, but the other sense of geothermal is, I, is using it uh, as a source for uh, heat pumps rather than, uh, you know, air. Good. So did you have a good day? So Tricia, are you, uh, are you asking a question here? I Sound just, like she got a I phone call. I think, yeah, I think she was asking, I, I'm guessing she was asking about household geothermal as an alternative for heating rather than persist systems. She was asking about it as a, as a source for heat pumps rather than yeah. air. Yeah. I'll turn that over to Steve. <clears throat> the, what was the question? I'm sorry, I missed the question. Uh, geothermal heat pumps versus air. Oh, they're much more efficient, <laughs> much more expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, New York, New York was pushing geothermal; it still does a lot. They've been pushing it, and uh, they, New York State, provides bigger incentives. A lot uh, high, high. In fact, other states do too, for geothermal because they are very efficient, but they are very expensive. And New Jersey does not provide that much. I think maybe fifteen hundred dollars for a geothermal which is something, but it's probably a 10th of the cost. So, so I think, I think the, the way we're going is really focused on air to air sourced heat pumps within New Jersey. Further points north, I think geothermal with colder conditions make more sense. By the way, Steve, uh, as part of, well, if you if you watched our uh, testimony today to the uh, environmental committee, um, if you were listening to me carefully, you would have recognized some language from your proposed letter to the governor that I used in talking about uh, building electrification. <clears throat> Super, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll be sending out letters uh, soon, I guess. We'll see. Um, we have various things that are under composition now and uh, in Google Docs that many people are commenting on. Uh, so thank you for your submissions. <clears throat> well, the time is pretty late. We've had a lot of people hanging in here, though, so we must have had interesting topics. So thank you all for attending. Uh, we will be sending out the slides and the recording uh, in the next few days. So thank you for coming. The next presentation will be May 19th, and then June 16th, and then July 21st. And I actually have speakers through July 21st, by the way. So <laughs> this is probably going to continue for a while. Thank you for coming tonight. I'm going to turn off recording. Thank you for hosting this. <laughs>